December 1 and 2 were the most dramatic, action-packed days in the history of this case. Some of what happened is worthy of the Marx Brothers or even the Three Stooges. Several people wrote accounts, uh, several of them, several times, of what exactly happened during these days. They disagree about a lot of details, but they all agree on the general narrative. Uh, their Chambers, Nixon, Stripling, the chief investigator of HUAC, and a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist named Bert Andrews. He'd covered the hearings for the New York Herald Tribune, which in those days was the leading liberal Republican paper, Northeastern establishment types, and he had written articles that were critical of HUAC and had won him a Pulitzer Prize, but he'd come to believe that Chambers was telling the truth. Anyway, here's what happened. Uh, the action begins in the morning of December 1st with Robert Stripling sitting at his desk in HUAC's offices. Nothing's going on in Washington. He's preparing to leave the government at the end of the month, go back to Texas and make some real money in the oil business, which he did, by the way. And he was reading the Washington Post, in particular a column that still exists called the Federal Diary, which normally features gossip that only people in Washington would be interested in, like who has the inside track to be the next ambassador to Peru or something like that. And in it, his eye fell upon a single paragraph entry that just said, and I quote, the Hiss Chambers fight is slated to make the news again shortly. Some very startling information on who's a liar is reported to have been uncovered in the Hiss Chambers lawsuit. And I imagine Stripling went, wow. Then, entering Stripling's office from stage right is a young lawyer for Times Outside Counsel, a young guy named Nicholas Vazana. He's one of the few people who never wrote anything about this case. He was in Stripling's office to conduct some research, and at one point, apropos of nothing, he said to Stripling, if I were Alger Hiss, I would, and he drew a cutting motion across his throat. And Stripling said, what? And Vazana said, if I were Alger Hiss, I would. And Stripling puts two and two together and says, Chambers has produced proof against Hiss in the defamation suit. Wow. And then Stripling reads another Washington newspaper, the tabloid Daily News, and sees a United Press story claiming that the Justice Department has decided to take no action in the Hiss Chambers controversy. And Stripling puts all this together and concludes what must have happened Chambers did, after all, have proof against Hiss. He produced it in the libel case, and the Democrats are covering it up. And he had his holy cow moment, and he drags Vazana, I imagine by his necktie, into the office of one member of HUAC who was still in Washington, and that's Richard Nixon. Now, a word about Nixon at this point. He had been reelected smashingly, but he seems to have gone into one of his periodic bad moods. The Republicans had lost Congress, President Truman was back in the White House and he wanted to destroy HUAC. And apparently Nixon felt that he'd sort of failed in the HUAC hearings. He, his grab for the brass ring had not quite succeeded and the nation was laughing at him. And to lift him out of his funk, he and Pat had booked passage on a Caribbean cruise to start the next evening from New York. Dick and Pat on the love boat. Well, Stripling bursts into Nixon's office with Vizana in tow and says, Boss, good news. And Vizana repeats his throat-slitting performance. And Stripling says, Boss, don't you see what happens, what this all means? It's good news. Chambers has the goods on Hiss. We can blow away the cover-up. We can make you a national hero, save HUAC. We haven't got a moment to lose. Well, you're Richard Nixon. What do you do? You say, yippee, let's go to war. Well, you wouldn't be Richard Nixon. He asked Vizana to be more specific. What the hell is this business? And Vizana said, I can't tell you. There's a gag order. I probably shouldn't have done this. And Nixon just exploded. And he said, I don't think Chambers has anything. I don't think anything's happened. And if Chambers has produced something, that means Chambers lied to me. We must have asked him time and time and again, do you have anything the Hisses ever gave you? Was there any espionage? And he swore under oath that he didn't have it. Now, if he says, if now he's got something, that means he, he committed perjury time and time again. You say this is good news, Strip? I hope you don't have any bad news. It also means that son of a bitch Chambers. I stuck my neck out for him. I went out on a limb for him. I went, I, I saved him. 
I made myself into a national laughingstock for him. I went out on his goddamn farm and we looked deep into each other's eyes and had this heart to heart. And, and you're telling me that all that time he had the goods on his and was holding out on me? Well, Vizana appears to have left and Stripling tried to calm Nixon down. And the two went out to lunch during which Stripling said that Nixon cussed him out in language he'd never heard before or since, and Stripling came from Midland, Texas. It was so bad, he said, I didn't even touch my food. But eventually, Nixon had vented and calmed down, and we got a car and decided to drive up to Maryland to see Chambers at his farm in Westminster. And they brought along Bert Andrews, the Herald Tribune journalist, and a stenographer named Rose Purdy, who's another cameo role player who left no memoirs, and late in the afternoon, they burst into Chambers' farmhouse. In the living room, there was a stuffed raven on the wall and a German Bible in the table. And they essentially asked Chambers, what the hell is going on? And Chambers, ever the man of mystery, looked out the window and said something like, I was afraid something like this would happen. And they all said, OK, you've had your moment of zen. What the hell's going on? And Chambers said something like, I can't tell you because there's a gag order. And then Stripling or Nixon, and again, both claim to have done the smarty pants stuff here, asked him what I call the $64 question, which was something like, oh, you mean that if you had produced proof against Hiss, you couldn't tell us? And Chambers said something like, yes. And then one of them asked Chambers what I call the $64,000 question, which is assuming you did produce something and it's covered by the gag order, is there anything else you have? Something you've not yet produced, something not covered by the gag order that you can tell us about and give us? And Chambers said, yes. And it will be an even bigger bombshell than my first bombshell which is the one I can't tell you whether or not it exists. And then in some versions at that moment or hours later in other versions, Nixon and Stripling discussed how to get whatever it was and keep it out of the Justice Department's reach. And they said, gee, if you just give it to us right now, uh, DOJ can subpoena it from us and put it in the same safe deposit box where they've hidden your first bombshell. But if we, sir, if the House of Representatives gives you a subpoena and you give it to us under the subpoena, under something called the separation of powers doctrine, it's beyond the reach of the Justice Department. And this means we need to go back to Washington and get a subpoena, a subpoena ducus tecum, it's called, to get a thing. And you know who has the authority to sign a subpoena on the behalf of the House of Representatives? Who's still in Washington? Blah, blah, blah. And Chambers said, look, I'm going to be in Washington tomorrow on my own errand. Why don't you go, you go back there now and do your constitutional folder all and get the subpoena ready. And when I'm done with my business in Washington tomorrow, uh, I'll come by your offices and you can give me the subpoena and we'll come up here and I'll give you my second bombshell in response to the subpoena. And they agreed to do that. They all got in the car to go back to Washington, except on the way out, uh, apparently Chambers tugged at Stripling's jacket and said, let me just ask you one last question. Um, do you at HUAC have facilities on which you could develop and enlarge camera film and pictures on camera pictures? And Stripling said, um, no, but thanks for asking. And according to Stripling, on the way back, Nixon still snarled that he didn't think Chambers had anything. I and Pat haven't had a vacation in three years. I'm sick of Washington. I'm sick of HUAC. I'm sick of you, Stripling, and so on. I'm going on the love boat, come hell or high water. Maybe Nixon was being rather Machiavellian. Maybe he just wanted to take a vacation. Maybe he was being Machiavellian, too, and thought, if Chambers has a bombshell, I'm, I can stage a dramatic return from the ocean liner and get more drama. And if it turns out to be nothing, I'm far from the scene of the accident. I'm on the love boat. So what have I got to lose by going in the love boat? And I get to keep my marriage. Well, for whatever reason, um, the next morning, December 2nd, as planned, Nixon left for New York on the train to go up to the love boat with Pat. And about the same time, Chambers was up in Westminster, and he had one foot out the door when he suddenly realized that he and his wife would be off the property all day. 
and his investigators had already been visiting the neighbors trying to dig up dirt on Chambers. Chambers said that, you know, his and his minions could come in here and ransack the house and find my bombshell and I'll disappear and it will disappear forever. Where can I hide it? Where no one would think of looking for it. And he said, I, I, seem to, I, I think Chambers says in his autobiography, I remembered seeing a movie once about some spies who hid some things in statues of Buddha that were round. And so I thought, what do I have that's round? And he said, behind the farmhouse, there was a strawberry patch that had been invaded by vines of pumpkins. So Chambers went out back, picked a little green pumpkin, took off the top, hollowed out it, the inside the way we do in Halloween, put his bombshell in it, and replaced the pumpkin exactly where it had been on the vine so it looked like it hadn't been disturbed, and he left for Washington. He picked up the subpoena at HUAC at about 2 p.m. and was back there at about 6.30. Stripling had spent the whole previous night setting up some hasty pudding operation to develop the films and get some enlargements. He was too exhausted. So two HUAC investigators, Donna Pell and William Wheeler, got in a car and followed Chambers north to Westminster. And they arrived at the farmhouse at about 10.45 p.m. Temperature was in the mid-30s and it was pitch dark. Chambers told the HUAC men to leave the car lights on, and he disappeared into the darkness behind the farmhouse. He reappeared, having not been able to find anything, and they went into the farmhouse and looked unsuccessfully for a flashlight, and all the flashlights they could find didn't work. Some things don't change. And then he remembered there was an outside light that lit up the back of the farmhouse. He turned that on, and he led the HUAC guys to the back of the farmhouse, to the pumpkin vines, and one of the HUAC guys looked at the other and said, what is this, Dick Tracy? And Chambers began kicking the pumpkins or picking them up, depending on which account you read. And finally, he picked one up and took the top off and said to the HUAC staffer Wheeler, I think this is what you're looking for. And Wheeler reached in and pulled out five rolls of camera film. Everybody calls it microfilm, but it was just ordinary store-bought camera film. In wax paper, to keep off the pumpkin goo, there were two rolls of film that had been developed on which were developed images of typed documents. The pumpkin also contained three little metal canisters and this is what camera film used to come in. You'd go to the store and you'd buy some film, it would come like this, you'd take it home into a dark room, open it up, take out the film, put it in your camera, close the camera, go out and take your pictures, go back in the dark room, take the film out of your camera, put it back in here, screw the top on, put black tape around it, take it to the camera shop, and a week later your pictures would be developed. Um, each canister contained a roll of film on two of them, the top was screwed on and was secured with black tape, and the third had no tape, and it had been dented. And the pumpkin was returned to the ground and left there. Later in the grand jury, the grand jury members were very upset that the UAC staffers hadn't bought the pumpkin because they all wanted to see the pumpkin. Uh, there was at some point some additional chatting in which um, Chambers said, Look, pictures on these rolls of these rolls of film have never been developed. Pictures were taken on them in 1938. I don't know if you can develop a picture off a film after 10 years. In addition, this one has no tape around and it's been dented, so light may have gotten in here and the whole thing may be lost. This is now your problem, not mine. Have a nice drive back to Washington. And after about 15 minutes, after they got there, that's what they did. And the next morning at HUAC's offices, they gave the films to Stripling, and he started his people working on them. Um, the film in the canister that was dented on top had indeed been struck by light. No pictures could be developed from it. From the other two films, which had to be developed 10 years after the pictures were taken, only blurred images could be developed. But from the two roles that had been developed, when the images were enlarged, 
There were 58 pages of State Department documents dating from January 9 to 13, 1938. One of them was marked strictly confidential for the Secretary of State. And now the UAC staffers had their holy cow moment. Well, Richard Nixon was on the love boat uh, having dinner with Pat at the captain's table when he received two telegrams. The first was from Stripling. Second bombshell obtained by subpoena 1 a.m. Friday. Case clinched. Information amazing. Heat is on from press and other places. Immediate action appears necessary. Can you possibly get back? And from the journalist Bert Andrews, documents incredibly hot. Link to his seems certain. My liberal friends don't love me no more, nor you. But facts are facts, and these facts are dynamite. Love to Pat. Vacation wrecker Andrews. Nixon showed the telegrams to Pat, and she said, here we go again. Well, Nixon contacted the Defense Department and demanded an immediate escort back to the mainland. And there are various accounts about how this was accomplished. But according to one by Professor Younger, the department sent a destroyer to pick him up, and it pulled up alongside the love boat. And a sort of canvas sling called a breeches buoy which is a large sack with holes cut out for the legs, was strung with rope between the two ships. And Nixon got in the sack, and sailors on both boats pulled the ropes. And slowly, he went from the love boat to the destroyer. And Professor Younger used to say, you know, people on cruise ships have cameras. And he said, somewhere, somewhere, in a family album or a shoebox somewhere, I want to see it before I die. There's a picture of the blue sky and the Caribbean and the love boat and the destroyer. And smack in the middle of all of it with his ass in a canvas sling is Richard Nixon. And he's going, I have never seen such a picture. Well, Nixon returned to Washington in a series of boats and planes, attended at each stop by more of the brouhaha of which the news media is capable. When one reporter mentioned the pumpkin papers, Nixon said, hmm? And when, he, when what Chambers done was explained to him, he thought, maybe we really are dealing with a crazy person here. And when Nixon reached Washington, he called what would undoubtedly be the most spectacular press conference ever held by a freshman member of the House of Representatives, vindication beyond his wildest dreams. And a few minutes before it, though, Nixon went through something that may have made him wonder whether going into public life was really worth the effort. Stripling was sitting outside Nixon's office talking with the 300 newsreel and other journalists who were setting up their cameras and getting their pads ready to record Nixon's words. And one of them casually asked, Chamber, uh, asked Stripling if he'd check the numbers on the side of the films. And Stripling said, what's that? And the guy said, well, um, every roll of camera film, it all comes from Kodak probably, has a number on it. And there's a man in Washington named Mr. Uh, Lewis, who's the Kodak liaison with the law enforcement community. And he has a little black book. And you can call him up and give him the number on the edge of the films. And he'll look in his black book and tell you what year the film was made. So that if these are pictures from 1938, you can give him the serial numbers and he should tell you the film was made look in his black book and say the film was made in 37 or 38. So Stripling said, OK. Walked into Nixon's office. I imagine Nixon standing in front of a mirror, checking his tie and making sure that his hair is right. Um, and uh, Stripling called Mr. Lewis and gave him the serial numbers off the films. And Mr. Lewis checked his black book and blandly informed Stripling that the films were manufactured in 1945, which meant, of course, that they can't have taken pictures in 1938. And the films were phonies. And Stripling said, are you sure? And Mr. Lewis said something like, of course, it's in the book. And the book's never wrong. Stripling put down the phone and said, Congressman Nixon, I've got some bad news for you. And according to what, which account you read, Nixon either imploded or exploded. He moaned and groaned that he was ruined. And my God, Hiss has been telling the truth. I knew this was something crazy about Chambers. And Stripling, it's all your fault. If I'm going down, I'm taking you with me. And that lying, smelly son of a bitch, Chambers, all the things you'd expect him to say. And Stripling said, now, Congressman, calm down. This can't be right. 
everything Chambers has told us is checked out. Some of the documents are marked confidential. We all know confidential documents are burned 24 hours after they get to the State Department. They wouldn't exist. Confidential documents made in 1938 wouldn't exist in 1945. There's got to be a sensible explanation for this, and let's just keep our powder dry and try and think our way through it. And I imagine all these thoughts, Stripling saying these things, as he's trying to remove Nixon's hands from around his neck. Then Stripling had the bright idea to call Chambers. They found Chambers at his mother's home and asked him, what would you say if Kodak said that the films you gave our, us, us were made in 1945? And Chambers paused and said, God must be against me. And Nixon said, what? Chambers said, God must be against me. And Nixon replied, probably with a few four-letter words, that he, would be t that he, Chambers, would be testifying before HUAC that evening, and he'd, he's got to have a better answer by then. And Nixon hung up and said words to the effect, well, I've got to go out there and tell the press, we, it's too late to call it off, I've got to go out there and say it's all a mistake, that Hiss wasn't what, what he thought he was, I'll have to apologize. It'll be the biggest crow-eating performance in the history of Capitol Hill, but I've got to go through with it. And Nixon may be contemplating the rest of his life doing fender benders in Whittier, uh, was walking towards the door, had his hand on the doorknob, whatever. The phone rang again, and Stripling picked it up, and it was Mr. Lewis from Kodak who said, you know, it sounded sort of important when you called us earlier, so I called headquarters in Rochester, and it turns out we used the same serial numbers in two years, and they were 1945 and 1938. And Stripling said, thank you, Mr. Lewis, and put down the phone, and depending, and he let out a rebel yell and gave Nixon the news, and depending on which account you read, the two men spent the next few minutes sobbing on each other's shoulders or waltzing each other around the room or jumping up and down on the sofa cushions and going whoopee, whoopee. And then they walked out to this gangbusters press conference, and Nixon said to Stripling, poor Chambers, nobody ever believes him at first. Back to Nixon, um, I don't know about you, but if I had been through what he had just gone through, I would need to lie down for a while. Um, Nixon had saved his career, saved HUAC, saved Chambers, and had put Alger Hiss in big trouble, and Robert Stripling had ended his career with a bang, but what did they forget to do? They forgot to call Chambers and tell him that everything was okay. Chambers went out. Eventually, somebody called Chambers and told him, was, everything's fine, it's all cleared up. But it was so draining that Chambers went out and tried to commit suicide. He bought a large can of cyanide at a seed store, went to a, has to be very complicated with him, went to a bedroom in his mother's house, opened the can, putting his head next to it with a towel over the can and his head so that he would inhale the fumes. But he woke up the next morning vomiting but alive. And this concludes the Washington part of this case and the congressional part of this case. The action now moves up to New York City and the courts. No more Marx Brothers and Three Stooges. It's time for Perry Mason. And some of the trial lawyers you're about to meet were as good as Perry Mason. <laughs>